Nowadays, if you run a rolling release or just pay attention to what's going on upstream, you're going to see the kernel version change on a fairly frequent basis. As the planning of this, I was on 6.5.5. Right now, I'm on 6.6.9. A couple of months ago, I was on 6.3.4. A couple of months from now, I'll be on 6.8.2. But the thing is, with the modern kernel versioning, even though it looks like it should, it looks like an actual system, it doesn't actually mean anything. It is bigger number, better person. Firstly, the third number is incremented. When the third number is too big and Linus just doesn't want to count anymore, then the second number is incremented. When that number is too big, then the first number is incremented. That is not a joke. That is not hyperbole. That is paraphrased from what it says on the kernel website. Does the major version number 4.x, 5.x mean anything? No. The major version number is incremented when the number after the dot starts looking too big. There is literally no other reason. But the kernel wasn't always like this. Back at the start of the kernel, they also didn't really have a system. That was until the 1.0 release. At this point, they started using a system known as Odd Even, where the odd numbers were the development releases, and then the even numbers were the stable releases. So for example, take something like the 2.3 release. This was a development release. This was not intended to be shipped out to distros. This was made for the developers to work on. And then eventually, after enough work, this matured into the 2.4 stable release. This is what went out to the distros. Then the third number was used to indicate the release on that release branch. So 2.4.0 is the first release of the stable 2.4. 2.4.1 is the second release, 2.4.2, so on and so forth. Nowadays, we definitely don't use odd even to indicate a pre-release. Instead, we use a system called RC, release candidate. So if you see a kernel that is dash RC, this is a pre-release kernel. Whilst being a little bit confusing to the user, this system was used with relative success for a couple of years. And then the 2.6 era happened where they threw that system completely out the window and didn't really properly replace it because 2.6 lasted from December 17th, 2003 to July 21st, 2011. Eight whole years on the 2.6 series. During this time, only the third number was incremented, getting all the way up to dot .39, and then eventually the addition of a fourth number. So what in the world happened here? And why did it ever stop? Like, why are we not still running the 2.6 era today? Well, to start with, this was the beginning of a major shift in development. Previously with the odd even system, if they wanted to bring in some major new feature, this was done on the development branch, this was done on the odd number. But now there is no distinction between odd and even, it's just all 2.6 and then when a new release is made, then the third number is incremented. So during this era, we had things like ext4 support added, butterfs support added, also replacing open sound system on mainline kernels, se linux support in mainline kernels, all of these being done with no distinction between odd and even, and these are major features that we're still using even today. But this caused a bit of a problem, because what if you're a distro like Debian, you want to ship the stable kernel, and then eventually ship something newer somewhere down the line. Right now, there's no distinction between stable and development, it's just all being thrown together. Previously, you could go with 2.4 and know, okay, this is the stable release. But this didn't last forever. Eventually, this happened. Adrian Bunk is now taking over the 2.6.16 stable branch. This is just a notice to everyone that Adrian is going to now be taking over the 2.6.16 stable kernel branch for him to maintain for as long as he wants to. He will still be following the same stable rules that are documented in 
this file right here, but just doing this for the 2.6.16 kernel tree for a much longer time than the current stable team is willing to do. We have moved onto the 2.6.17 kernel now, so if you have any patches that meet the stable requirements for the 2.6.16 kernel, please send them to him and not the general stable team, as we will just delete them. And I'd like to offer my best wish to Adrian for doing this work. Personally, I don't think it can be done for all that long of an amount of time, and I'll be very happy to see him prove me wrong. This was a precursor to what we now know as the LTS kernel. Now, if you know anything about the kernel maintenance, it's kind of funny to see Greg say this, because nowadays, Greg is often the guy making the LTS releases. But understandably, Greg did have his concerns. This was back in 2006. The idea of a long-term LTS kernel just hadn't been done yet, so nobody really knew if this was something that people wanted, this was something that you could actually reasonably do and keep backporting things in an efficient way. So it was just like, okay, you can go and do it, and if it works, well, eventually, Greg got more involved with it. This alleviated one of the problems, but didn't fully eliminate the issue. Now we have this very slow-moving release that is on this one set of features and then gets backported security patches. But there's still this whole weird experiment that is 2.6 where there's no clear distinction between development release and stable release, and it's just a giant mess. There still needs to be something to deal with that. And eventually, that did come along. That being, announce Linux next. This is a system that still exists today. For reference, here is Andrew's original musings. I perceive the following problems with kernel development. The 80-odd subsystem trees are developed in isolation, leading to large number of patch time conflicts when I merge them all, large number of compile time problems, and occasional runtime problems as a result of the merging. This is large because the subsystem tree owners aren't being particularly disciplined in keeping their changes contained to their area of responsibility. It's a large amount of work to merge all the trees, and it is very dull. This is the main reason why MM releases are down to one every few weeks, rather than the old two or more per week. Those few MM releases have a large number of regressions. Developers aren't particularly responsive in handling those regression reports. Mainline kernel releases also have a large number of regressions, ones which are leaking through the MM process. Very few kernel developers actually bother testing the MM tree. Consequently, most code hits mainline without its emitter having done much testing of the resulting code combination. Few kernel developers are testing other kernel developers' development code. Practically, the only public testing which the various trees obtain is via the MM process, and that process is collapsing for the above reasons. People who develop against a particular tree are not spending sufficient time reviewing and testing changes which other developers are committing to other trees. People who raise patches are preparing them against Linus's tree, but by the time we get into the late RC time frame, Linus's tree is very different from the accumulated pending trees, so many patches fail to apply or don't work correctly, and the originator runtime tests them against Linus's tree, not against the tree into which they are to be merged. Developers are sneaking patches into mainline merge window at the last minute, before they've had a decent period of review and testing. So, what I propose is that we start a formal unified development tree called the Linux Next Tree. And just doing this solved a major problem, because now there is a clear development branch. Regressions can be dealt with in Linux Next, and hopefully they don't make their way into these stable releases. So even though we're still on this weird 2.6 thing, if you see 2.6.30, 2.6.31, you are very clear that this is a good stable release. It might still have regressions. That can still absolutely happen. But the regressions aren't happening in that stable branch in the merge window. They are happening on the development branch before they ever get to you. And this is how things mostly continued up until 2011 with the shift into 3.0. But 3.0 wasn't the original plan. Linus sent out this email to the mailing list. 
short merge window reminder, normally the merge window would be a bit longer. This is the time where you can send up patches to Linus to get them merged into the next release. But at the time, he was in Japan with a slow laptop, and merging patches into the kernel takes a bit of time, especially on fairly slow hardware, and some people like to submit patches on the very last day. So if it was a normal merge window length, um, Linus either wouldn't be sleeping or the kernel would be very late. So he gave himself a couple of extra days and this was just a reminder of that. But that's not the important part. This down here is, P.S. The voices in my head also tell me that the numbers are getting too big. I may just call the thing 2.8.0, and I almost guarantee that this PS is going to result in more discussion than the rest, but when the voices tell me to do things, I listen. Linus, please don't listen to the voices. In this case, it was a good idea, but you know, generally the voices are not super helpful. And as we were already very close to the number, Ingo Molnar said, well, before we get to 3.0, why don't we just wait till the .42 release? That'll be nice. Which Linus shot down. Besides the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I think 40 is a fairly nice round number, which we never actually got to. And that's because 2.8 never existed. It just became 3.0. Yay! Let the bike shed painting discussions about version numbering begin, or at least restart. It had been a good couple of years since the kernel had a proper versioning system. I decided to just bite the bullet and call the next version 3.0. It will get released close enough to the 20 year mark, which is excuse enough for me. Although honestly, the real reason is just that I can no longer comfortably count as high as 40. The whole renumbering was discussed at last year's kernel summit and there was a plan to take it up this year too. But let's face it, what's the point of being in charge if you can't just pick the bike shed colour without holding a referendum on it? So I'm just going all alpha male and just renumbering it. You'll like it. And that's what he did. He just deleted the numbering system and was like, you know what? This is what we're doing now. I don't care what your opinion is. This is what we're doing. So what are the big changes? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Sure, we have the usual two-thirds driver changes and a lot of random fixes, but the point is that 3.0 is just about renumbering. We are very much not doing a KDE 4 or a GNOME 3 here. No breakage, no special scary new features, nothing at all like that. We've been doing time-based releases for many years now. This is in no way about new features. If you want an excuse for the renumbering, you really should look at the time-based one 20 years instead. So no ABI changes, no API changes, no magical new features, just steady plodding progress. Now, one of these new possible numbering systems was from Greg Crower Hartman. Hi, you brought up this topic a few months ago and passed it off as something we'll discuss at the Kernel Summit, but then that never happened, so I figured I'd bring it up here again. So as someone who constantly is dealing with kernel version numbers all the time with the stable trees, our current numbering scheme is a pain at times. How about this proposal instead? We number the kernel based on the year and the number of releases we've done that year. So year, number, minor release. For example, the first release in 2009 would be 2009.0.0, the second 2009.1.0. If we want to be a bit more non-zero counting friendly, we can start at 1 for the number. So 2009.1 for the first release, 2009.2 for the second release. Then the stable releases can increment the minor number. So 2009.1.1 for the first stable release, 2009.1.2 for the second release. The great benefit of this is that more accurately represents to people just how old the kernel they are currently running is. 2.6.9 would have just been 2004.9.0 on this naming scheme. There were a lot of people at the time that were running really, really old 2.6 kernels, and because it said 2.6, they didn't realize how old it was. So someone might have been running a five-year-old kernel at that point and didn't even notice it was. And yes, we can handle the major minor macros in the kernel to provide a compatible number so the automated scripts will not break. That's not a big deal. Any thoughts? Let the bike shedding begin. This did receive 
quite a bit of feedback and I'm sure had a lot of bike shedding involved. But ultimately, as we know from the modern numbering, it didn't really go anywhere. Now, as for the system that did go somewhere, 3.0 did cause a couple of issues. Add a personality to report 2.6.x version numbers. I ran into a couple of programs which broke with the new Linux 3.0 version. Some of those were binary only. This patch adds a uname26 personality that makes the kernel report a 2.6.40 plus x version number instead. The x is the x in the 3.x. I know this is somewhat ugly, but I didn't find a better workaround and compatibility to existing programs is important. So 2.6 was around for so long that some applications <laughs> were hard coded to look for 2.6. This was a really weird time for Linux, and I am so, so very happy that it actually came to an end. I know some people complain still that Linux has this, like, it looks like a major minor versioning system, but it's not at all. And some people still get confused about it and like, why don't we use another system? But it doesn't really matter. The version number doesn't need to have a meaning. On Linux, it just indicates if the number is bigger, this is a newer kernel. That is all you need to know. That is all you need to think about. And you know what? I think the system works perfectly fine, and it's much better than being on 2.6.500 now. And you know what? Nobody wants that. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. How long have you been using Linux? Has it been one year? Has it been five years? Maybe you've been here from the start. I would love to know. So if you like the video, go like the video. And if you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, Scrubs, Libero Pay link in the description down below. That's going to be it for me, and as you've noticed, it's become a bit of a trend where I forget to record the outro.